Uh, so we all know that climate change is happening, even though many people try to say it isn't. So climate change is recognized by many scholars to be a growing contributor to social, economic, and political unrest over limited resources, and thus to increasing intro and interstate conflict. This plenary will examine the ways in which worsening climate crisis has already contributed to the outbreak of violence, and why it will almost certainly converge with crises to exacerbate future tensions at the local, national, and global levels. The environmental impact of war is another aspect of climate change that has profound implications for human security and peace. Environmental destruction caused by the activities of global militaries only fuels climate change. A vicious cycle has begun where climate change acts both as a contributor and to the consequences of war. And we know that the U.S. is, the U.S. military is the largest individual entity of carbon footprint. So join our panel as we address these important issues of what we can do to, to mitigate for breaking the cycle. Join, because you're here. So on our panel, we have Boyce Granton. He's the author of War Porn and Learning to Die in the in the Africana. That's Bill Granton. I can't say it. <laughs> yeah, uh, Reflections on the End of Civilization. His journalism, essays, fiction, and scholarship have appeared widely in the New York Times, Rolling Stone, the Nation, Descent, and elsewhere. He teaches at the University of New Jersey. Antonio Uhas is a leading energy analyst, author, and independent investigative journalist specializing in oil, an award winning writer. Her articles appear in many major publications, including Rolling Stone, The Atlantic, CNN.com, The Nation, Minutes, and more. Uhas is the author of three books Black Tide, 2011, The Tyranny of Oil, 2008, and The Bush Agenda, 2006. And Roxanne Dunbar Orton grew up in rural Oklahoma as a child of land farmers. As a veteran of the 60s revolution, she has been involved in movements against the Vietnam War and imperialism, union organizing, and was one of the founders of the women's liberation movement in the late 1960s. Roxanne is a historian, writer, and professor emeritus in Native American Studies at California State University, East Bay. She is the author of many indigenous related books and articles. Her most recent book is An Indigenous People's History of the United States. Um, so each, uh, each uh, panelist is going to come up in the order that spoke Gordon Scranton, Antonio Uhas, and Roxanne. And, um, and then afterwards, we have uh, some questions now. The United States of America has been at war continually across the world since at least September 2001. Where the U.S. is not directly engaged in fighting, often today through teams of assassins and remote-controlled attack drones, it's a training, funding, and arming combatants from Ukraine to Indonesia, fomenting ongoing global violence. These wars are part of a consistent policy of American military expansionism and commercial hegemony, traceable from the Indian Wars of the 19th century to the wars against Spain and Filipino independence through World War II to the present. The area into which the United States has most recently expanded its military and commercial power is the Middle East, which the U.S. has been fighting to control since the 1970s, and meddling in since the early 20th century. The importance of the Middle East to American state interests lies not in the markets its population offers to American consumer goods, nor in our humanitarian concern for the rights of Arab women, nor in an idealistic desire to foster democratic governance and political freedom, nor even in loyalty to the state of Israel, but in the region's vast fields of oil. President Jimmy Carter articulated America's interest in the Middle East in 1979 with the announcement of the Carter Doctrine, putting the world on notice that the United States military would enforce stability in the Middle East. A certain kind of stability, to be sure. Not the political stability of individual states, but a kind of balancing act where no one regional or extra-regional power would be allowed to dominate Political and economic unity between oil producing states would be undermined by manipulation of statecraft, an oil funded arms race, and sectarian conflict. And petroleum would be allowed at gunpoint to flow uninterrupted from the desert 
tear gas conflict. As energy expert Daniel Jurgen wrote in his book The Quest, specifically about the American invasion of Iraq in 2003, neither the Americans nor the British were pursuing a mercantilist 1920-style ambition to control Iraqi oil. The issue was not who owned the oil at the wellhead, but whether it was available in the world market. Ensuring the flow of oil from Middle Eastern wells to the world market was the intent of the Carter Doctrine. The issue was framed as a matter of American energy security, which had a certain logic before the development of hydraulic fracturing technology, fracking, opened up vast new areas of extraction in North America. But the dynamic of work, even in 1979, is less about directly serving purely American national interests than it is about maintaining a free and secure field of play for transnational corporations in the flow of capital. From the point of view of Exxon, Mobil, and Shell, union organizers are more dangerous than jihadis. An independent and functional social democracy in the Middle East is more of a threat than Islamic fundamentalism. Hence the long, productive relationship between the US and the House of Saudi Arabia. And the dark engine of global terrorism, the political historian Timothy Mitchell has christened Nick Jihad, a hybrid compound of American military power, international oil companies, and conservative Islamic domestic politics. President Obama's efforts to shift the balance of power in the Middle East through rapprochement with Iran might be seen as a laudable attempt to put distance between the US and the terrorist and its terrorist funding Saudi allies. It might be seen as great power politics pitting a weakened state against one that has grown too strong. Or it might be seen as a series of mistakes in which a hopeful vision of American leadership displaced a more sanguine and cynical view of regional power politics, creating only problems without necessarily solving. Old ones. With, is that House of Saad? The CIA shut the lights off? <laughs> <laughs> I keep going. But, uh, you still got a mic. You can't, you can't shut me up. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The situation in the Middle East now, a humanitarian disaster of massive proportions, seems to be something that the U.S. and its corporate leaders can live with. As horrific as the Syrian civil war is, it's not seriously impeding the flow of oil. And as a proxy war between Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey, it's helping an increase in American arms sales across the region and boosting the U.S. economy. The Islamic State, ISIS, or Daesh, is only a minor threat to the flow of oil. Although their vigorously centralist, anti-capitalist economic management does offer a real ideological opposition to contemporary neoliberalism but they're most eminently useful as a boogeyman to frighten children and voters. <laughs> Meanwhile, from drought in Syria to anthrax outbreaks in Arctic Siberia, from flooding in Louisiana to record-breaking heat waves in Kuwait and India, a changing global climate is putting increasing stresses on state and global infrastructure. The sense of imminent, unavoidable collapse of these disasters in part combines with an increasingly persuasive Malthusian logic of global scarcity uh, as we heard in the song, uh, to produce a toxic fog, fear, aggression, and greed, out of which emerge the nationalist, xenophobic, warmongering demagogues, currently taking the stage as the aspirant leaders of the world's terrified masses. The post-1945 international order is coming apart, and we seem to lack the kind of leaders, collaborative machinery, and political unity that would be required to keep it together long enough to stop or even slow down a rush off the precipice of carbon dioxide driven heat death. Oil, of course, is at the center of all this. Burned carbon, burned oil, and coal is what's trapping the heat that's going to melt the ice that will flood our cities. And one of the world's largest sources of that burned carbon is the global network of transportation and production that runs on petroleum. So this is our situation. This is our situation across the planet. But we experience the violence <clears throat> of that world, mostly at a distance. Here we are, well-fed, ready to just have lunch, in sunny, beautiful California, and getting all worked up about things happening all across the world, halfway across the world. It's true, people are fighting and dying ruined cities all over the planet. Old women are bleeding to death in bombed rubble. Children are being murdered. Neighbors are killing each other. Far away and sometimes not so far away. To live in that world is horrific. 
noise and danger put every nerve on edge. The only things that matter there are survival, killing the enemy, and having a safe place to sleep. Human life narrows to a cutting edge. I remember living in that world many years ago as a soldier in Baghdad. Today, that world seems impossibly distant, even as it presses in on me every day in a never-ending stream of words, images, appeals, and reports. I see videos, I read stories, I hear talks, I have feelings. I see pictures of this or that injustice, and I'm moved to act, perhaps, but more accurately, to emote, to react, to perform. We don't usually ask where these feelings come from or what they serve, but the cultural technologies transmitting these affected vibrations are not neutral. News outlets shape information that their owners' prejudices, while Facebook, Twitter, and Google shape our perceptions through hidden algorithms. Through the specialization and demographic targeting of contemporary media, the tendency is to narrow the channels of perception to the point where we, we receive only those images and vibrations which already harmonize with our own prejudices, our own pre-existing desires, thus intensifying our particular emotional reactions along an increasingly narrow band, compelling us to discharge that emotion within the same field of ready listeners, for which we will be rewarded with likes and favorites or applause. Our consciousness is shaped daily through feedback systems where some item provokes a feeling, and we discharge that feeling by provoking it in others. We crowdsource our catharsis, creating self-contained wave pools of aggression and fear, pity and terror, stagnant flows that go nowhere and do nothing. Pictures of children killed by bombs or police or pictures of the devastation left in the wake of a tropical storm may move me to sadness and horror. Retransmitting such images will pass along that sadness and horror. My act of transmission will mark me as someone who has feelings about these things and as someone who condemns them, which of course I do. <clears throat> I can rationalize my retransmission by saying that I'm raising awareness or trying to influence public policy. I want my fellow citizens to also be horrified, so perhaps they'll think like I do, or perhaps they'll vote for a representative who works to prevent such horrors from happening, or maybe so that if enough of us all think the same way and feel the same way, the organs and institutions of power will be forced to hear us and align themselves with us, the way that a honeybee colony will pick a new hive through the dance of its visionary scouts. <clears throat> that might be an obscure reference. Uh, these show, these are our democratic animal. They pick new hives, they send out scouts to all these different hives, and the scouts come back and dance. And each scout doing a different dance that describes the hive and where it's at. And more and more of the bees will dance for that, that one particular hive until enough of the bees are all doing one dance and they all fly off. They all fly off for that new hive. Sometimes it happens that uh, two dances are equally as important as that. And what happens then is the hive usually splits and one half dies. <clears throat> These are perfectly reasonable human assumptions because that's how physical human collectives function, rounds. Anyone who's been in a crowd, a sports game, a nightclub, a choir, or a protest knows how bodies resonate together. But politics is the distribution of bodies and systems. And we live in a system of carbon-fueled capitalism that you can't depend on to work this way, especially when it comes to responding to the threat of global warming for a variety of reasons. Our political and social technologies are not neutral, but to let develop to serve particular interests, most notably targeted advertising, the concentration of wealth and ideological control. The vibrations that resonate most strongly along these social channels are fear, anger, mindless pleasure, the more we pass on and react to social vibrations, the more we strengthen our habits of channeling, and the less we practice autonomous reflection or independent critical thought. With every protest chant, we retweet, amen, or a Facebook post, we become stronger resonators and weaker thinkers. Yet, however intense these vibrations grow, they remain sequestered within machines that offer no political leverage. They do not translate into political action. They don't connect to the flows of power. <clears throat> Finally, while the typical collective human response to collective threat is to name an enemy, pick sides, and mobilize community response, global warming offers no clear enemy. That hasn't stopped people from trying to find one. <laughs> one climate activist has argued that 90, just 90 companies are responsible for almost two-thirds of all historical greenhouse gas emissions. 
which may be true, but it also conveniently exhausts billions of automobile drivers, airline passengers, meat eaters, and cell phone users of responsibility. The enemy isn't out there somewhere. The enemy is ourselves, not as individuals, but as a collective, as a system, as a hive. How do we stop ourselves from fulfilling our faith as suicidally productive drones in a self-consuming hive? How do we interrupt our perpetual circuits of fear, aggression, crisis, and reaction, these circuits that continually prod us to ever more levels of manic despair? Another way to ask these questions would be to ask what today in this world does peace look like? What does it mean to be for peace? How can we realistically, effectively work for a more peaceful world? Ending war and decarbonizing the global economy are both beautiful, obvious goals, of course. The kind of thing anyone might say, yes, let's do that. Things are rarely so simple, though, and not one of us, not even President Obama or, or the Koch brothers or King Saud, has the power to simply decree such a goal and make it happen. Obama couldn't even manage to close Guantanamo. <laughs> he did. You know, there's, there's constraints on all of us. All of us, however powerful or however disenfranchised, are obliged to negotiate within multi-layered hierarchies of power and a melee of competing interests. So what can we do? What can one person do? What can one organization or institution do? As I argue in Learning to Die in the Anthropocene, the biggest question we face today isn't whether to buy an electric car or decarbonize the global economy. The biggest question we face is how to live meaningfully. And how to live mean <clears throat> excuse me, how to live meaningful lives in a world undergoing radical change, over which we seem to have little rational control. You've heard the call. We have to do something. We need to fight. We need to identify the enemy and go after them. Some respond, march, chant for revolution. Some look away, deny what's happening, and search out escape routes into imaginary tomorrow's life off the grid, space colonies, or consumer station in a wireless, robot-staffed, 3D-printed techno-utopia. Meanwhile, the rich take shelter in their fortresses, trusting to their air conditioning, private schools, and well-paid private guards. Fight, flight, fight, fight. The threat of death activates our deepest animal drives. Sociologist Tom Pratisky writes, people will do almost anything to avoid being afraid. When, despite their best efforts, fear and anxiety do break through, people go to incredible lengths to shut them down. Sometimes, when these vibrations shake us, we discharge them by passing them on, retweeting the story, reposting the video, hoping that others will validate a reaction, thus assuaging our fear by assuring ourselves that collective attention has been alerted to the threat. Other times, we react with aversion, working to dampen the vibration by searching out positive reinforcements, pleasurable images and videos, something funny, something, anything to ease the fear. We buy something, we eat food, we pop a pill, we fuck. And either passing on the vibration or reacting against it, we let the fear short circuit our own autonomous desires, diverting us from our goals and loading ever more emotional static into our daily cognitive processing. We become increasingly distracted from our ambitions and increasingly susceptible to such distraction. And whether we retransmit or react, we reinforce channels of thought, perception, behavior, and emotion that, over time, come to shape our habits and our personality. As we train ourselves to resonate fear and aggression, we reinforce patterns of thought and feeling that shape a society that breeds the same. <clears throat> the human psyche naturally rebels against the idea of its end. Likewise, civilizations have throughout history marched blindly toward disaster because humans are wired to believe that tomorrow will be much like today. It's hard work for us to remember that this way of life, this present moment, this order of things is not stable or permanent. Across the world today, our actions testify to our belief that we can go on like we are forever, burning oil, poisoning the seas, killing off other species, pumping carbon into the air, ignoring the ominous silence of our coal mine canaries in favor of the unending robotic tweaks of our new digital imaginary. <clears throat> Yet the reality of global climate change is going to keep intruding on our collective fantasies of perpetual growth, constant innovation, and endless energy 
just as the reality of individual mortality shocks our casual faith in permanence. The greatest challenge that climate change poses is not how the Department of Defense should plan for resource wars, whether we should put up seawalls to protect Manhattan, or when we should abandon Miami. It won't be addressed by buying a Prius, turning off the air conditioning, signing a treaty, or even voting. The greatest challenge we face is a philosophical one, an existential one, understanding that this civilization is already dead. The sooner we confront our situation and realize that there is nothing we can do to save ourselves, the sooner we can get down to the difficult task of adapting with moral humility, kindness, and compassion to our new reality. Thank you. Um, I'm Antonia Juhas. Um, in addition to my uh, long bio that you've all got in your book, um, I also am on the National Advisory Committee of Iraq Veterans Against the War. So, um, and I'm going to wait till my. There we go. We'll just take a sec. So I want to start. Um, by welcoming to you to Refugee Camp BP. This is a refugee camp that I visited in May in Greece, right at the border with Macedonia. And you can go to the next one, Robin. Uh, these are primarily refugees from this camp um, from Iraq and Syria, but the majority of uh, refugees are from Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. And um, what you'll see in the pictures is representative of the majority of refugees in Greece now, which is that 70% are women and children. So you'll see a lot of um, children and women in these pictures. And this was an impromptu refugee camp set up of a refugee trying to get through um, across the border into Macedonia. And of course, the borders came down and they were stuck. And they set up their camp on top of the BP gas station. And it's known um, go ahead, among um, the, both the people who live there and the volunteers who support it as refugee camp BP. Um, so this is the camp in the distance, and here's the gas station. Go ahead. And one more. And we'll stop there for a moment. So um, I've spent the better part of probably two decades um, trying to untangle the relationship of oil and war. But one of the things that's happened over those two decades is um, a, a deeper entangling with three sets of problems, which is um, the oil industry needing to push farther to get oil, it's becoming more difficult to get oil. The oil that's left in the world is mostly spoken for, it's owned by governments, or it's in increasingly difficult places to reach. So deep, deep, deep underwater, you have to frack to get at it, you have to fight a war to acquire it. And at that same, during that same period of time, the impacts of our consumption of oil and fossil fuels has led to an ever damaging corruption of our climate. So most people who work on this call it climate chaos, extremes of weather as a result of our oil consumption. But the more and more we get entangled with oil, the more power we've also given to the industry, the more control it has exercised over our ability to make individual decisions that move us off of oil. The further extremes we've gone to meet its ends and the increasing consequences of climate, and there's this churning of climate or oil. But I don't think at any period in my two decades, and I've traveled to a lot of places studying oil from the bottom of the ocean to uh, Afghanistan and many places in between, um, have I seen such an um, extreme vision of the consequences of this uh, cycle as refugee camp BP. So these are, as I was saying, refugees from Syria and Iraq in particular, stuck on top of a BP gas station, trying to get free. And if there's any um, embodiment of 
winners of the Iraq War, and there are winners of the Iraq War, which has, of course, pushed into the war in Syria. The winners are, BP is certainly high on that list. The list also includes BP, Exxon, Chevron, Shell, ConocoPhillips, Halliburton. If there are losers, not losers as people, but people who have lost the most as a result of these wars, it's certainly embodied in these individuals who have lost everything, have nothing to go back to, and now nowhere to go, and are stuck on top of a gas station. Um, also, though, this embodies why they can't go back, which is the continuation of this conflict and war, which is driven, continues to be driven by oil and continues to be driven by climate change. So um, if you can go to the next slide. So I've written a lot on these issues, and so I, don't, I won't go into detail because there isn't a lot of time. I've done a lot of the background writing on the role of um, corporations in the decision making leading up to and then um, uh, the outcome of the Iraq war in my book, The Bush Agenda, which is why I brought a couple copies of, of the back with me today. Um, and I think though I did the best like short version in this CNN piece that I wrote. Um, and this is, in this article I made clear, I didn't write the headline, good thing to note, if you ever read articles, the person who writes the article almost never writes the headline. Um, the headline is, is more extreme than the article. I never argue that the only reason why we fought the war in Iraq is oil, but certainly it's a key uh, objective. And the way to test that is in the outcomes. So the outcomes were, prior to the invasion of Iraq, all the Western oil companies were shut out of Iraq's oil. Following the invasion, the U.S. government, together with oil companies, rewrote Iraq's laws to open up Iraq to foreign oil companies under the terms that they set. And then in came Exxon, Chevron, BP, Shell, Total, ConocoPhillips, and now they're all sitting on the largest oil fields in the world, pumping oil from the largest oil fields in the world, including from northern Iraq, and a lot of their bases are in Irbil, and that's gonna be important. Um, I would argue, though, that there have been times when the United States has gone to war to ensure a flow of oil to the United States or a secure source of oil to the United States, that wasn't the case at this stage of the Iraq War. The Iraq War was about, in terms of oil, um, was about a couple of things. One is, you know, denying the power of that oil to someone who had emerged as our enemy, um, denying the power of that resource to people we don't like. But it was to put it in the hands of oil companies, it was their interests that were being served. And there's no, um, th there's nothing that says that if Exxon has access to Iraq's oil, that the United States, therefore, is gonna benefit from that oil. There's no relationship there. What the relationship there is, is that Exxon will benefit, and Chevron will benefit, and ConocoPhillips will benefit, and they will give the money from that benefit to support the candidates who they like. And 99.5% of the time, that is Republicans, and in particular, in this case, it was the Bush and Cheney administration, and that administration was serving their interests, and their interests were very well served, and just this week, they re-signed um, their major contracts in Iraq, continuing that control. Now, um, I think go to the next one. Should I order it? I think so. Yeah, so then just real quick. Um, so we all know um, the roots of uh, Islamic, Islamic State are Al Qaeda in Iraq, which was formed in 2004 in opposition to the U.S. and coalition forces. Um, many Iraqis were pissed off that we had occupied Iraq. One of the reasons being a clear understanding and belief that one of the goals of that war was to acquire or take control over Iraq's oil, and that's exactly what happened. Um, and then Islamic, then uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq changes its name to Islamic State. If you want to form a state, well, pretty much anywhere in the world, but particularly in the Middle East, you do that by acquiring oil. And that's the first thing that Islamic State set out to do, and it moved into Syria, and essentially took over Syrian oil fields, refining, and distribution, and that remains its primary source of income. It then moved into Iraq and took some smaller oil fields in Iraq, and that wealth supports 
Islamic State. And obviously that activity created enormous amounts of, of instability in Syria, driving for the conflict in Syria, and driving for the conflict in Iraq. Um, also, just to note this one, most recently, after the terror attacks in Paris, when there was a response, a military response to those terror attacks, the very first strike zone was the Syrian oil fields to try and take those back from Islamic State. Next one. So that's one piece, um, is the role that we, the fighting over oil, right? But of course, this really critical secondary piece is that our addiction to fossil fuels, our consumption of fossil fuels is intensifying climate change. And climate change is creating its own conflicts. And this is just one, I think, really telling slide on that front. It's just, just 2012 alone. And this is the more than 32 million people in the world in that year who were displaced due to extreme weather. And that means you leave your home. And what is most often is the long-term displacement is really most often caused by heat and drought. So much of the world is still rural and lives off of agriculture. So you can no longer farm. You have to go somewhere else. You go into a city that's already strained, already dealing with its own conflicts, already dealing with its own resource struggles. And now you have a mass influx of people. And that creates further instability. And then you often have to leave your country altogether. And this is very much a story about what happened, part of what also happened in Syria. Extreme drought in Syria pushed people out of the rural areas. They couldn't farm anymore. They went to cities that added to already existing tensions and struggles in the cities that exacerbated the war. And it forced even more refugees to flee Syria and become the refugees that we saw. Um, that, um, that is only going to, only going to come worse. Um, I just threw through this in really quick because um, I think a lot of you have probably heard about this latest issue with ExxonMobil and it's, it's being referred to as Exxon New, ExxonMobil's, uh, the evidence that ExxonMobil denied climate science that it itself learned in the 70s. Um, are people familiar with this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so one of the um, consequences of our going to extremes to satisfy the interests of the oil industry is that that also builds up the wealth of the oil industry, which also gives it more influence over policy decisions. So our ability to deal with climate change as a societal issue, our awareness of the issue, the policy tools that were made available to us were deeply, deeply constrained by 30 years of ExxonMobil using its vast sums of wealth to build up the opposite, right? To build up the argument that there's no such thing as climate change, um, and to literally remove policies that were being, to rewrite policies within the Bush administration, to eliminate policies that were being designed to look at climate change from previous administrations, and to literally write them out of legislation um, within the Bush administration, and to write them out of policy within the Bush administration, and to set us back decades in, um, knowledge that was available to us and actions and actual policy that was available to us. And because the oil industry has also been um, suffering a, a victim of its own um, wealth, the victim of its own success, uh, because we let the industry go anywhere and everywhere it wanted to go to the deepest depths of the ocean to fracking fields fighting wars for it, there is an, a surplus of oil, and that is one of the reasons, although not the only reason, for the price of oil and gasoline dropping so uh, dramatically, and now reducing the wealth of the oil industry. That's led some people within our movements to say, um, well, the oil industry is over. We don't need to worry about the industry anymore. And I just want to put that into perspective. We have had significant success in tackling the oil industry, and one of the reasons why is that it's fighting so many battles right now because of its weakening um, 
uh, profits and revenues that it's bringing in because of the fall in the price of oil and gasoline, that it's weaker than it's been and more susceptible to our to, to organizing and activism. But I just want to make sure we remember what the wealth is that we're talking about when we're talking about this industry because there really are almost no other parallels. The banking industry is one, and now it's sort of out of nowhere in the last couple of years, tech is the other. Um, but in, in one of the worst years in 20 years, which was 2015, we're still talking about $260 billion in revenue for ExxonMobil. That's larger than most of the economies on the entire planet, right? And this was a really, really bad year. Um, go to the next one. And then I think most importantly is looking at their profits because that's the money that they have to work to influence policy with. And then again, in a really, really, really bad year, ExxonMobil last year had $16 billion in profits. This isn't to, um, this is, isn't to turn you off from organizing around those, these companies, it's to turn you on to it. Um, because it, it just is to put to rest the idea that all we have to do is sneeze and the oil industry will go away, uh, which is, seems to be percolating a lot. And that's not the case. It's going to take organizing, it's going to keep, keep, keep doing what a lot of people are doing. Okay, the next one. Um, so just really quick then, um, when the changes that were put in place in Iraq in terms of its oil laws were also put in place in Afghanistan and successfully put in place in Afghanistan. And this is a photo that I took. Um, this is on top of natural gas fields um, in Afghanistan. And the only difference in Afghanistan is that one, there obviously isn't nearly as much oil or natural gas wealth, so it's not as great of a draw, but it does have oil and it does have natural gas. So the United States figured, what the hell, as long as we've invaded, let's rewrite the laws, and we did very successfully. Um, the oil industry was not interested in coming in, mostly because there was not nearly the stability and not nearly the wealth, but just so we know, the laws were changed. Those same laws, by the way, were just changed in Iran. As part of the negotiations um, on the nuclear deal, Iran is trying to re-enter the international oil market. To do so, it agreed to fund basically fundamentally the same set of rewrites that happened in Iraq and Afghanistan and now Iran, opening it up to foreign oil companies really on their terms. So then, you know, what, what we do about these problems, and I've just been throwing this out there, to throw it out there. Um, one, 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 uh, these are the burning oil fields of Kuwait in 1991. And this is what it looked like. And uh, next slide. So this is what um, Donald Trump has said about Islamic State. I would. I bombed the hell out of the oil fields in terms of how do you deal with Islamic State, knowing that Islamic State controls a lot of oil. I bombed the hell out of the oil fields. I then get Exxon. Um, I get these great oil companies to go in. They would rebuild them so fast your head would spin. Ask if you need U.S. troops to protect the oil companies, specifically, Trump said, yes. You put a ring around it, meaning troops around the oil companies. You put a ring. Next one. And to just point out sort of where the place where we're at, the oil industry. In the future, you are going to need every molecule of oil that you can get from every source. Defenders of wildlife. You have to kill people, kill wildlife, and kill the last wild places to get what's left of the world's oil. But the good news, this is an issue about which people care desperately, both peace and climate change. But the awareness about climate change is increasing dramatically. And as you can see from this chart, this is Americans' preferred solution to our energy problems, emphasizing the production of oil and gas, which is the bottom one, emphasizing alternative energy is the top one. 73% of Americans, 73% of Americans don't agree on many things. Uh, and that's to, to, to address, to embrace alternative energy, and to reject fossil fuels. This is a very strong sentiment, go to the next one, and it's true among both Democrats and Republicans. So for the first time, a majority of Republicans now hold this view as well. 51%. That's a huge change. Almost 90% of Democrats. 
Next one. And this is part of a movement. So I believe very strongly that what we have to do is organize so that we have the capacity to make individual decisions that change the course of what's happening. So when we can change the public policy platform, for example, that provides us with the opportunity to pay, take public transportation instead of having to drive an individual car, that's a policy change that we can control. A policy change that says we reject the use of the military to uh, secure resources for oil companies, or even to get oil, is a policy decision that we can uh, influence. And there are mass people organizing on these issues in greater numbers than have ever organized before. This is from Paris. Um, I believe, uh, I wrote a, an article that was called, um, Paris is a way station in the climate change fight. So the Paris Climate Accord had some very significant problems, it had some advantages, but what it mostly was, was a, a point of organizing and transition within um, building a much broader and active and collective climate change movement because it brought people together from all around the world. And that was in Paris, and this message of leave it in the ground has become the dominant message. Um, the next slide. Um, this is the um, grassroots, grassroots Global Justice Delegation in Paris. Um, people um, from the United States, impacted by extremes of climate change, organizing and mobilizing with other frontline communities and other impacted people in Paris. Um, they were really um, jazzed by the experience of the organizing that they experienced there um, and brought that home next month. And then that went from marching to a series of coordinated direct actions targeting fossil fuel production all around the world. So there were actions simultaneous on one day all around the world. There were more than I could count. Um, this was one action. This is a massive coal digger at a coal field. The white dots are people who have shut down the coal digger. And the message is keep it in the ground. These direct actions happened and shut down points of production, transport, um, refining, um, uh, because everything, yeah. Um, and the next one. And so this message of keep it in the ground actually originated, some people say in Nigeria, some people say in Ecuador, um, around the 70s and 80s, and really coalesced in the 90s. And the message is just because we have fossil fuels doesn't mean we need to use them. And that we can choose to leave them in the ground. And we can organize to achieve that and support in particular frontline communities that are struggling to make that happen where they live. And in the era of climate change, as we heard, we're all a frontline community. Uh, we can all see ourselves linked in that way and to uh, support this call and then do what we can to see that uh, take root in our lives. So thank you very much. So good to be here. Thank all of you. Um, uh, for being here, I kept, you know, I'm a little 60s activist person. I kept saying this really feels like teaching in, um, in the universities in the 1960s. It's just very, just the energy. Is really Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I have to do this little leading like the others. <laughs> well, I, I'm really honored to uh, be invited to speak at a Veterans for Peace um, convention and um, uh, honored to be with uh, these two wonderful panels that have given, you, given us so much uh, substantive um, material. Antonia is my source for Everything catching up on um, the research she does is incredible. You know, do follow her work and buy her book. Uh, and I want to um, acknowledge that we're on uh, Ohlone Nation uh, territory. So, so I want to talk about um, an alternate reality that has existed in the past and the core and strands of which continue right here in North America. 
And being a historian, I need to take us back to the beginning of human civilization. We'll get through it pretty quickly. <laughs> Pre-colonial indigenous Americans were able to support complex societies with extensive agriculture as well as building large cities and towns. However, in every instance, when these civilizations grew to the point of depleting resources and producing autocratic governments, they decentralized. What charlatans like Jared Diamond see as collapse, and historians see as rise and fall of civilizations, I see choices being made. And this is where we are right now, having to find a way to make some choices. One key element was missing before 1492, as the metaphorical date of the rise of capitalism. And only in Europe did the social condition exist that would give rise to it. It is amazing how many better choices can be made without the profit motive and with reverence for survival of the collective. The colonial myth of a sparse population of Neolithic hunters and gatherers in Amazonia and the Arctic regions and seacoasts has long masked the reality of the pre-colonial Western Hemisphere, in which the indigenous peoples had built economies and institutions that supported populations as large as Europe at the time, but without the motive of profit and accumulation of individual and corporate wealth. Capitalist accumulation and private property were not inevitable developments of human societies as the Western idea of progress argues. Nor is Tina, there is no alternative to capitalism, true. It's a necessity that there is an alternative to capitalism, or we're doomed. The necessary change that is required for survival of life on this planet will take more than sustainable development and an end to fossil fuels although both are absolutely necessary. It will require a radically different relationship of human beings to one another and to the land and to all other animals and creatures and to the universe. Outer space is being colonized too and polluted. As food sovereignty theorists Sam Gray and Raj Patel write about Native Americans' relationship to the land, given the kin-like relationship to the land, it is more accurate to understand its commodification made into real estate, bought and sold, not as a deepening reification, but as enslavement. Just as people have a right to their land, the land has a right to its people. This is the logical terminus of a line of thinking that begins with the idea of the cosmos as a living entity, not resources to be consumed. There are serious misunderstandings and politicized scientism about pre-colonial Western Hemisphere civilizations that preceded European colonization, which prevent us from learning about the special relations the special social relations and economies of the civilizations and the indigenous knowledge systems that still exist today. As a birthplace of agriculture and the towns and cities that follow, the Western Hemisphere is ancient, not a new world. Domestication of plants took place around the world in seven locales during approximately the same period around 10,000 years ago. Three of the seven birthplaces of agricultural civilization were located in the Western Hemisphere, all based on form. These were the Valley of Mexico and Central America, or Mesoamerica, the South Central Andes in South America, and the entire Eastern half of North America. The other 
Early agricultural centers were the ones we do learn about in the second grade. Tigris, Euphrates, and Nile system, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Yellow River of Northern China, and the Yantes River of Southern China. During this period of development, 10,000 years ago, many of the same human societies began domesticating animals. Only in the Western Hemisphere was the parallel domestication of animals eschewed in favor of game management, a kind of animal husbandry different from that developed in Africa, Asia, and Europe. And this is perhaps a significant difference that we need to think about. And the term hunter is a European concept that is not accurate to apply to native animal husbandry. They brought the animals, attracted the animals to game parks that they built. Uh, and that they lived in the wild. And they were food. Indigenous American agriculture was based on corn. Traces of cultivated corn have been identified in central Mexico dating back south of 2,000 years. 12 to 14 centuries later, corn production had spread throughout the temperate and tropical American uh, continents from the southern tip of South America to the subarctic of North America and from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean on both continents. The wild grain from which corn was cultivated has never been identified with certainty. There is no such thing as wild corn, like wild wheat, wild barley, wild almost everything. Since there is no evidence of corn on any other continent prior to its post Columbus dispersal of Western Hemisphere products, the development of corn is a unique invention of the original American agriculturalists. Unlike most grades, corn cannot grow wild and cannot exist without attentive human care. Along with the multiple varieties and colors of corn, some 95 or so, each with different nutrient values, Mesoamericans cultivated many colors and kinds and sizes of squash and beans. These were the three sisters, which were extended throughout the hemisphere as were the many varieties and colors of potato cultivated by the Andean farmers beginning more than 7,000 years ago at 16,000 feet of elevation. Thanks to the nutritious triad of corn, beans, and squash, which provided complete protein, the Americas were densely populated when the European monarchies began sponsoring colonization projects here. Theft of indigenous, um, indigenous land and food crops was a primary method of British in the United States colonial occupation and ethnic cleansing to make way for model crop production, agriculture, mostly non-food crops. That was the beginning of industrial agriculture and the basis of US capitalism. The total population of the hemisphere was about 100 million at the end of the 15th century, with about two-fifths in North America, including Mexico. Central Mexico alone supported 30 million people. Experts who acknowledge this and know it, and only experts seem to know it, doesn't get out into the textbook, I uh, have observed that such population densities in pre-colonial America were supportable because the peoples had created a relatively disease-free paradise. That's a code uh, that's often used. But that's not really true, as they've done any research. There were diseases. There was bubonic plague um, in the Southwest. There was gonorrhea. There were, you know, there were diseases. There were human beings. And there were health problems. But the practice of herbal medicine and even surgery and dentistry, and most importantly, both hygienic and ritual baking, which Europeans didn't do, kept diseases at bay. Ritual sweat baths were common to all Native North Americans and South Americans, having originated, like most 
every nation of organizations in Mexico. Too often we place blame for ecological destruction on the very existence of human beings and human societies. But this self-hate is toxic, and it is self-hate. The problem is capitalism, which is not the same as commerce and trade and lives well lived. And capitalism emerged with military invasions and conquests of the people's land and resources of the Western Hemisphere, spread to the rest of the non-European world, and they continue today, led by the United States. Nearly three centuries of rapacious and militarized European exploitation and genocide in Africa, Asia, the Pacific, and the Americas culminated in the birth of the United States as the first state founded as a capitalist state. And that capitalist economy was born in the cotton kingdom in the 1820s, based on stolen land and enslaved African bodies not just the later bodies, as commodities bought and sold, accumulating capital. In this U.S. system, unique among colonial powers, land became and remains the most important exchange commodity for the continued accumulation of capital. When I say land, I mean all the resources in it for owner. To understand the genocidal policy of the U.S. government, the centrality of land sales and the building, the economic base of U.S. wealth and power must be seen. So war and the economy have been inseparable from day one of the United States of America. This is also the source and character of the U.S. military. As Air Force officer and military historian uh, John Bernier writes, in our military heritage, U.S. Americans depended on raising and destroying enemy villages and, and, and fields, that means native people, killing enemy women and children, raiding settlements for captives, intimidating and brutalizing enemy non-combatants, and assassinating enemy leaders. In the wars against native nations between 1607 and 1814, Americans forged two elements, unlimited war and a regular war, into their first wave of war that is still the core and a heart of the U.S. military. In cases where a rough balance of power existed, Grenier observes, or if the Indians even appeared dominant, as with a, was a situation in virtually every frontier war until the first decade of the, uh, of the 19th century, Americans were quick to turn to extravagant violence, a prefigurative pattern, Grenier calls it, of U.S. annexation and colonization of indigenous nations across the continent for the following centuries. A vanguard of farmer settlers led by seasoned Indian fighters calling on authorities and militias of the British colonies first and the U.S. Army later to defend their illegal settlements, forming the core of the U.S., uh, the core dynamic of United States democracy and patriotism. And this is John Grenier's uh, uh, point of this book, the first of uh, the uh, first way of war. John Grenier uh, um, book, American War Making on the Frontier, 1607 to 1814, which he wrote to show the use of special forces and rangers in the world today as a direct descendant of uh, the Indian Wars. So this is the military that's loose on the world today, and it's got to be stopped. U.S. power and, as importantly, U.S. patriotism is maintained through this regeneration through violence. 